welcome to our Dragon Age Day uh, 2021 interview with acclaimed actor Steve Valentine. I do, many, own, I do my own applause. Which, which we're, let's all let's all join in that. Whose many <laughs> stage and screen credits include Crossing Jordan, Supernatural, Mom, Psych, Modern Family, Supergirl, Monk, Leverage, and over a hundred more. Because he's a genius and he's brilliant. He's an award-winning magician and the creator of Magic on the Go, as well as, of course, playing the voice of Alistair in Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great to be here. Hello and happy holidays, everybody. And thank you for doing this. This is great. Every year, without fail. It's, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Well, you were a big part of our success this year. Thank you so much. I'm excited. We raised over $27,000 for Able Gamers. Ah! And it was Yay! And it was deeply in, thanks to you and so many others. So thank you Amazing. very much for doing that. Um, I'm going to jump right in. And my first question is for me. Uh, when did you know you wanted to be an actor, Steve? Uh, I think I was about, oh, I know, I know the exact moment, actually. It was, uh, we were, uh, I was maybe seven or eight years old, and we had one of those uh, teams of actors that used to tour around the schools. And we had this moment where, um, they were doing a, a play for the school and I was sitting in the front row and I didn't get it. I wasn't that interested. And then they wanted a kid to come up and help out. And so I was like, oh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll come. Mm -hmm. but that, that was interesting to me. I was like, yeah, I'll come up. I wasn't nervous about that. Mm -hmm. So I go, they pull me backstage and they say, okay, so we're going to give you a shovel and we just want you to lean on it. And then when I ask you, when we tell you like you should be working, what do you think mm -hmm. a shovel's for? Mm -hmm. You have to say leaning on. And I always mm -hmm. remember this. And I was like, okay. And they were like, because it's funny. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I didn't get it. I didn't get the joke. And, I, and so I go out there and I'm just leaving. And they, they turn to me and they say, so Steve, oh, what are you doing with that? You, what do you think a shovel's for? And I remember saying, leaning on. And the place went crit like the kids. <laughs> this, and that one moment of, I guess, dopamine, adrenaline, everything, mm -hmm. right? Just coming at me. I'm like, oh, I like this. I like this feeling. And then I started hamming it up and had the best time. So from then on, I joined a, a dancing school. We did a show every year, and then I joined a theater company, and we would do a couple of productions a year, and it just kind of grew kind of organically from that. It's just a desire to perform on stage, whether it's magic or mm -hmm. stand-up or, 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 or you know, playing characters. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite stage role or a role that you would love to play that you haven't played yet? Oh, God. well, I mean, back in the day, I. Mm -hmm. I I always wanted to play the artful dodger in Oliver. Mm -hmm. That was, that was to me kind of, uh, that was the epitome of, of you know, I, was, did, I did a lot of the theater when I was a kid, but that was the role that I always wanted to play, that cheeky kind of street urchin kind of, I'm a bit old for it now. Although I think it'd be really interesting to do Oliver with all adults playing the kid roles and the kids <laughs> playing the adult roles. I don't know if anyone would ever do that, but- um, It would uh, add some interesting subtext. It would, because it's such a dark show. If yeah. you actually look at the musical, uh, it's really dark. But that was, I think that, and then there's a play that I love called The Long Mirror, which I'm hoping to put on at some point by J.B. Mm -hmm. Priestley. Um, it's a great character in that. So, yeah. Every character has something interesting that you can get your teeth into, you know, kind of like learn from. I think that's the mm -hmm. key. It's just to expand yourself as you do it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is a requirement for you as a window in, you, you know, whether or not you take a role might be dependent on whether you're finding something to connect with there? I think it used to be that uh, I would take a role if it came along. That was the key, right? That was <laughs> working just like, actor, it, yeah, right. You're a working actor. Hector yeah. Elizondo once said that, you know, he doesn't have a career. He he, he just does jobs. And I think that's the, the best way to look at it because you can yeah. lose a career, but you, you know, you, if you just do jobs and you just go from job to job, and it's got to be fun. And in the early days, it was definitely kind of like whether I want to play this character or not. But mm -hmm. then I'd always end up quite often having a great experience or learning something or meeting someone. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just became that. I'm, I have friends of mine who are like who will pick one out of ten roles to do, and mm -hmm. I'm more along the lines the Michael Caine school of you know take what comes your way because you never know. Even if you don't really want to do it, you never know where it's going to lead. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely, I just did, um, finished shooting the first uh, of a series of movies for, for Nickelodeon and Mattel called Monster High based on the toys. I saw and, that. That's coming yeah, up, right? It, yeah. So we just finished the first movie and a lot of the people that I've met in the last 
15 years, 20 years of well, 25 years, Jesus, of doing acting in the US, uh, a lot of people were involved in it in like different different ways and different levels. People I met 10 years ago, somebody I did a pilot with is now one of the top execs at Mattel. And you know, you just you just kind of like it's always this interweaving web of connection and friendship and you just never know when you're going to bump into these people again michael kane again as twice i've mentioned him but <laughs> he has a, an audio book called uh, from the elephant to hollywood and in that and it's get the audio book because he narrates it it's like he's talking to you and um he set you know he maps out his career and you can see where he took a job and he met someone and then later on they became the head of studio and then they came back and offered him alfie you know or, or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something, and each thing affects the career so I try and have a more global view of, of working as an actor rather than just kind of the insular. Mm -hmm. That's great though. Yeah. It's probably a lot more satisfying for you too that way. So, and mentally it healthy. It's pretty healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of, yeah. I feel like the universe is going to put in front of me stuff that, that I need at some point. Um, I have a great question next for you mm. from Sherry. Uh, Sherry Lisas, Sherry Lisas on Twitter. Sherry, if you want to wave, if you're here, um, who wants to know if you have any fairy, favorite fairy tales or books? Do I have any favorite fairy tales or books? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I just, my daughter is 10 now. And so we've read every night I read to, if I, unless I'm actually on camera, I will read to my kids no matter where I am. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm working away, I'll read to them via Zoom and, um, or FaceTime. And I think that there's two series of books that we've really loved. Obviously, I mean, I say obviously, but the Harry Potter books were mm -hmm. just, a blast and I, at the beginning when i started reading the harry, harry potter books my daughter would be like don't do the voices daddy just read it <laughs> and then and now it's like you know we have all the voices for all the characters and uh, i'm not i'm no jim dale but it, it, we we really get into <laughs> by the time we get to the eighth books you know i'm just yeah. like you, you, all those characters um that i think i think the harry potter books are some of the best children's books ever written they're just the the way they move, the way she even describes scenery, and yet, mm -hmm. you know, like some books will describe the scenery and the setting and you'll be like, oh, everything's stopped. Mm -hmm. She just has a way of integrating it and keeping it going and it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. So those are great. And then my son loves the spy school books. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I love those too. But I just started reading Treasure Island for the first time to them. Oh, that's such a good and one. I, I, every now and then I'll change a word because I know they won't understand it or it'll be, super, you know, super old, but, um, it's, it's very interesting to see them react to like such an old classic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's still so good. Long John Silver is an amazing character. So, right. Yeah. So they're all great. And, and we have, um, <coughs> excuse me, but we have, um, also I started to read Peter Pan, which was a bit weird. So mm -hmm. we stopped reading Peter Pan. Um, and, and that's really kind of, uh, as I, as I read my, most of my reading nowadays is, is to the kids. It's, it's mm -hmm. I very rarely get to, uh, just kind of sit and read a book for myself. That's really special though. Um, I have a question from that's Mrs. Alenko to you, Bellandaris on Twitter. Hello, <laughs> how are you love? She wants to know what's your favorite and least favorite costume or makeup that you've ever had to wear for a role? Oh, um, you know, quite often you'll get like the, your least favorite when you're doing it, but it looks amazing mm -hmm. when you see it. And it's usually, along the lines of um well i know when i did i'm in the band for disney we had a lot of crazy costumes on that and i think probably my least favorite for that was the um uh the velcro suit when we had to jump against the wall and because <laughs> what they don't tell you is as soon as you hit the velcro wall and you stick your mm -hmm. whole body weight just goes down it pulls down yeah and it is it was excruciatingly painful let's just put it that way um <laughs> So that was probably my least favorite suit of all time. But, uh, you know, just like Monster High right now, I would say that, you know, it's not that it's the least favorite. It's just that you get up at three in the morning to go in and do the makeup and it takes right. a couple of hours and you're sitting there and they're gluing pieces on and, and they're, they're um, I have this amazing, I can't wait for you guys to see it. Like I play Dracula, of course, <laughs> on, uh, on, uh, in, in Monster High. And he's more just like a, you know, um, Eastern European dad is expecting too much from his daughter, but, yeah. uh, but he happens to be a vampire. But the makeup uh, took hours because we had to, the skin is a certain color, the, the ears were pointed, so we had to glue those on. We had these giant contact lenses. And I think my least favorite thing is anytime you, they have to put contact lenses in my eyes. Oh, 
that's supposed to be yeah it's not fun right it's just that you're acting through a mist you know you mm -hmm. can't really see that well these were hand painted yellow contact lenses they look beautiful when they're in but i actually got an eye infection from the makeup it just clogged my pores right here so at one point you'll probably notice in the movie one eye <laughs> is a little swollen but uh, <laughs> but the makeup kind of hovers uh, covered that but uh, yeah i think anything where you know and, I'm, and i've obviously got the fangs in so those mm -hmm. those are challenging not least favorite but they're challenging mm -hmm. to act through and yeah. become a part of, of who you are and uh uh and in the end I, when i saw the some of the film already it, it's looks great it's it so looked great so it was it. worth it yeah it was so <laughs> worth it yeah um we're gonna move on to a question from alex nord firefighter on twitter Alex right. wants to know, how did you get the part of Alistair? And Z uh, would like to ask what you can remember about the audition process for Alistair. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because it was all very fast moving. I'd been sent, my agent had sent me an audio recording, an audio audition, so I just did that at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sent it in and we didn't hear anything. And it was just, they just, it was a couple of line, uh, pages of dialogue. What they usually do is they send you like an, a cartoon of the character, picture of the character, uh, they'll give you his background. Mm -hmm. um, I could probably look it up. I don't, on my email somewhere, but the, um, so we read the lines and you just do it. I mean, there wasn't a direct flair for the audition or anything. I just did it at home. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I didn't hear anything. Uh, uh, and then I got a call saying, um, are you interested in playing the role? There was an act, another actor who had the part. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened, but he was no longer playing the role and they'd already kind of started recording. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, I think it was something along the lines of a Friday, do you want to play it? And a Monday I was in doing it. I think it was oh, that far. Great. Wow. And, and you have to kind of, unlike um, a scripted role where you spend time with the character you literally don't get any time whatsoever so you arrive at work the great thing is you arrive you can look as crap as possible it doesn't make any difference turn up in your jammies with a coffee and actually <laughs> food in your teeth no one cares and um you go into the booth and you have these four hour increments that you work and Ginny mm -hmm. was our director was amazing and then we were patched into the entire creative team mm -hmm. and uh the writers, I mean, the people who created the entire world, right? So if there was any questions that I had, I could just ask and say like, where's he coming from? What happened right before this? Um, and, and they tell you, and then you just go, you don't have time to go, okay, so how would I feel? That's a, okay, it's <laughs> yeah. some kind of emotional, you don't have any time. So, and this is what's brilliant about it. You tap into this other side of you, this kind of instant create what kids do right because mm -hmm. kids when they play i'll say to my son we're on a plane and he'll be like Woo! and he's instantly there he's not like i'm a pilot i'm playing pilot with daddy and um, he's not like that he, you know you go yeah. there and so you tap into this child side of you and um if you go off course they'll just nudge you in the right direction never uh, never somebody going to say it like this but more like um actually steve he's very angry coming out of this right now or let's he's a little more sarcastic because this has happened and this has happened or if they've already recorded somebody else's voice like i think they'd already recorded claudia um they'll play a line back mm -hmm. so you kind of it's like you're acting with the person but you're not really but it's very okay. very solo it's very kind of in the booth um and you would do so they'll give you stack of papers this thick a4 paper and there's maybe eight to 12 lines on each page mm -hmm. and you just go wow you do like three or four takes for each line and they and Jeannie was amazing because she knew when she had it you know she'd be like yeah okay that's the one and we move on and mm -hmm. it's literally that fast so sometimes um if i hear a line from the game mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be like i don't remember saying that <laughs> It was or, just so fast. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. Or, or I'll hear a line going like, oh, I could have done that a lot better. <laughs> but um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's the ultimate improv in a way, because you're, you're, you're not improvising the line, but you're improvising everything around it, how to say it, the motivation and then the emotion of it and everything. Yeah. Um, um, Crystal, uh, CC, Crystal Fox on Twitter, uh, said that, uh, Alistair's voice is a distinctive and beloved one in the fandom. We all know this Yay, is true. Yeah. And what was your process in finding Alistair's voice and mannerisms? Cause it's so distinct. It is. And I, and I feel like, um, 
a lot of that was just from the initial description of the character when I did, you know, when I first auditioned for it. I just kind of knew the, I think what I was trying to go for was he, this idea of the reluctant king mm -hmm. in that, you know, you think of a king, like a lot of the other characters in, in Dragon, they, they speak very much like everyone's Patrick Stewart, right? You know, and it's very <laughs> like this. Whereas he's just like, he's, he's this kid who's like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I want to be. And oh, right. Okay. That's happening. Is it? And it's just, it's just this kind of, I don't know. There's the, it was like the anti Shakespeare kind of mm -hmm. attitude towards that. I had, I thought, well, if he doesn't want to be a King, then he doesn't speak like a King. He shouldn't sound like one because anyway, mm -hmm. that should be inside of him anyway. Um, and I think that's just kind of the core of where that came from. He was just this, um, flippant youth mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, the one thing I remember saying to them is when you finally animate all of this, please give him a six pack. <laughs> and they did. And I've seen it in many of the, the fan fiction. Oh yeah. We so, will. Uh, <laughs> we'll be getting to some of that. A little yeah, I'm sure down. we will. I'm sure we will. Yeah. Was there a, uh, did you have an approach? Um, Ash Inquisity on, on Twitter wanted to know if you had a specific approach to getting a character for Alistair or did you just arrive and you were ready to go? we just i mean there was no time it was literally just arrive and go and i think that's part of that's that says a lot to the casting because mm. you you hear if somebody has the role you know they say in film especially that 90 percent of a director's job is the casting right because yeah. and then you let the, the actor has something that works for the character then don't mess with it guide it tinker with it a little bit but don't really mess with it and i i guess they they heard something in my voice that that worked for Alistair, you know, that was kind of because in all video games, we need to be distinctive. If we also if we all sound the same, it's going to get very confusing. So I, I feel mm -hmm. like they already knew that I was there. And then it was just the, the guidance of Ginny and, and, and everyone in, uh, in Canada uh, in my ear. Yeah. Well, I would say that you succeeded in making him distinct. And I mean, I, I think he's one of the most beloved characters of all time. So oh, wow. I, and this is my That's first that was my first first real video game. I mean, I've done a few bits and pieces here and there, but that was the first real game. So that's great mm -hmm. to hear. Um, Binky would like to know, um, we all know that Alistair loves cheese and Binky wants to know if you love cheese as well. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> On many different levels. Yes. Yeah. I like cheese. On all Ooh. levels. <laughs> On all levels. I like, um, no, you know, what I do love like when I get home from set quite often, uh, I, especially this last month when I was kind of just kind of locked down in Vancouver. We had, um, I had a, a, a blue cheese sanigur with a glass of red wine crackers. It's perfect. Yeah. That was my nighttime ritual. <laughs> Not good well, for my uh, COVID weight, but it was good for, uh, yeah, it was good for my soul. You have to take a moment, you know? You do. Yeah. Now, the next questioner is incredibly perfect. Ferelden Fondue would like to know. <laughs> I just love the name Ferelden Fondue. How and can, I'd like to can... ask Ferelden Fondue if they've made a Ferelden Fondue <laughs> and what does that taste like? probably cheese if it's pharrell and do we really want to know no, no um no, no, we do. you're right let's move on <laughs> they, they want you to know that alistair is their ringtone and it has occasionally led to some awkward yet amusing situations um okay. and they, they wanted to know um it sounds like you answered this a little bit um all your lines for origins were they done solo uh did you have any interaction with the other voice actors i don't, I don't remember having interaction i don't okay. think we did i think no, I think that everybody is recorded individually. But like I said, okay. when once they have someone else, and they have you get the, a little of that, that yeah. for you, so it's a little. So you'll have like the the tone and the rhythm of the of the, the you know because it might be I might say something a bit too slow if you've got a ramping tension in the scene or, mm -hmm. and the pace starts picking up and then I come in and go like well <laughs> and I'm like no that can't work so they'll yeah. play that and. Um, and then that that really helps to kind of set the, set the tone. But yeah, I think Uncharted was we would do because it was motion capture with a lot of the same actors actually when we did Uncharted. Oh, that's great. But yeah, it was Claudia. It was kind of a very I think it was the same year, a Dragon Agent and Uncharted, and um, that was motion capture. And then in the studio, and then in the studio with Nolan, which is a whole nother uh, experience, but um, a good one, brilliant one, mm -hmm. but uh, but not with Dragon Agent. No. Mm -hmm. So everyone's um, off doing their own thing, you know, and yeah. you kind of you pick it up wherever you are. What's great is we can't hear that. It does sound 
so unforced and and real and natural and it really sounds so wonderful we would never know that it was just you and think, Boo, you know i so. think that's i think that's also you know testament to the editing and the direction and picking the right lines you know if you've got mm -hmm. as you go it's a giant jigsaw puzzle i mean they mm -hmm. showed me the map of where everyone it's my, i couldn't get my head around it you know it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it you know it was the great thing about having the creators there and mm -hmm. um, there and in, in my ear because I, I wouldn't have known kind of half the time okay here's where he's done this and he's become the warden or here's where he's you know he's, he's he wants to be king or he doesn't want to be king or that he's mm -hmm. you know he's, he's likes this girl but it, it just you you need that and mm -hmm. that was such a gift it's like normally as an actor you do your research on your own but you've got the person who is the research wow. who's right there yeah and that, i think is uh was is the, one of the best things about doing video game do you have any um hannah would like to know if there were any fun anecdotes or stories for when you were recording your lines that you remember that you can share or um the only the only i mean the only thing i the, the toughest part of doing any video game is i always wait till the end of the day for the grunts and the screams and the you know and you always feel like such an idiot <laughs> you just you know or maybe it's you know like a little more oh, yeah. <laughs> oh you know and they might be like can you make that a little more sexual and you're like oh <laughs> Ah, and like too, it's too much deep and you know <laughs> and, and you just and, and you just feel like you just like grunts and uh, uh, you know the, you're standing there and they'll be like okay you get punched in the stomach uh, but it's only a light punch uh, and there's a bigger <laughs> punch uh, and then you're being kneed in the crutch oh uh, and then you do, you have to do all these things and you just you do you feel like a you feel like an idiot uh but it works you just hope they're not going to put it all on the internet for other people to use yeah <laughs> thank god i'd like to know oh. what uh, the alistair ringtone was that gets her into trouble uh that would be very interesting uh <laughs> what's the what are the words probably uh the lamppost line i would imagine i'm you know, I, I would bet all right you're at dinner and then you somebody share, for all then you have to tell us in chat if you're here um and then do you have a favorite line i know there are a lot of them um and and you know and, and you're probably asked this all the time um Jeanette at Raging Orchid on Twitter would like to know if you have a favorite line from Alistair so the, this is so the, the thing about the lines from Alistair is that, that um like I said there's so many I mean I think we did four thousand five thousand maybe more if, if I try to add all these lines together and then yeah. it, it was I think six days two eight four hour sessions a day mm -hmm. And that's all I'm there's always new stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think I think it's the fans that pick the best lines. I think yeah. the, the, the swooping is bad is is obviously That's a classic. Fun. And then I literally uh just heard my delivery of have you ever linked a lamppost in winter? <laughs> and I don't remember doing it in such a salacious manner, but I guess that's the take that that, that they did. So I think that's really uh that's very interesting. Well, and uh, it probably kind of this was and it was a while back for you so it's kind of it's you know it's probably interesting now to re to hear yeah. it now and you know and, and yeah look yeah back. yeah it is it is and, and then Devi and catbird asked uh if you have a favorite memory or scene uh that you when you were playing alistair that stuck out in your mind uh there was a very emotional scene that sticks out it, it, it's interesting because in when you're acting in um on camera uh, mm -hmm. you know you feel like you need the, the emotion has to come through mm -hmm. when you're acting in voice it only has to come through in the voice but it was interesting that when is it on camera it comes through in the face and the eyes and everything but it was just interesting to me that when i would do an emotional moment um it would still come through and even though i wasn't trying to do it with the eyes and the face and everything like it would it would actually come through so it was a good learning experience as, as an actor you know as there's a uh, kristen linkladder wrote a book on the voice and and most people's um actors uh you know hang-ups with various things like emotion which is a huge uh, thing for actors you know can i cry on camera can i do you know mm -hmm. a lot of that is linked to the voice mm -hmm. and if the voice is connected to the body those things will flow uh and it was interesting to do an emotional scene and not be so concerned about that and yet and then find that kind of power of emotion that would kind of flow through so i think that was kind of the biggest lesson and, and, and you could and, still hear it you could still yeah hear it. yeah but you don't see the problem is you don't have a scene like it's not like when you record it you i'll do like i'll have a scene and it's line by line and uh so my memory is just of doing line by line by line and the lines will mean different things depending on anything else that's going on around it so it's hard to 
to define a single scene because they can change. Yeah. They can be different depending on what type of atmosphere is in that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and well, and we've got some great questions about his arc that I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, but yeah. Andrea Steeny had a really fun question. Wanted to know: Do you think Alistair is more of a cinnamon roll or a himbo? Uh, definitely a cinnamon roll. Definitely a cinnamon. Roll. Roll. I think so yeah. too. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah, I think there's a there's a sweet naivety to him. Yeah, and then Angelica Meatful Reads on Twitter wants to know if you improvised any of your fight dialogue or was every single thing scripted. I feel like 90 percent of it's scripted. They it, they worked on this for such a long time, and they have all the lines. I don't I, probably it, some of the fight stuff. There might have been a moment here and there when I was really getting into it later mm -hmm. in the in the um, in the recording sessions. Where I might say, "What about this?" But honestly, I think the improvisation comes in the delivery and um, bringing it to life. That's kind of kind of where I think the actor uh, brings it. The writing's so good, and it's. It is so already there that who am i to come in and start saying how what what needs to be said and half the time i don't know what needs to be said because i don't know what's where this is coming from because the writer mm -hmm. has created this entire storyline so i trust i think the biggest thing trusting in the writing and the directing mm -hmm. um and then allowing yourself to be free in the delivery that's more the imp where the improvisation is mm -hmm. That makes sense <clears throat> because it is, it's like a playable novel. It's so huge. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 Gyne Droid, Gyne would like to know uh, yeah, from hello. Warden to Hero to uh, who sacrifices himself against the Archdemon to King, yeah. what is yeah. your favorite fate for Alistair? He can go so many directions. Um, does it does it matter what my favorite fate is? Because yes. isn't it about what the, what you, the people play in the game? one or i don't know I, I feel like there's no wrong answer <laughs> there is no wrong answer but i you know part of my ego is that i would i like him to become king i, I mm -hmm. do i yeah. do too so, i think he, I actually because i think in the end i think he would be a really good king because there's the, the the kind of humanity that he would bring to being a king is mm -hmm. would be welcome mm -hmm. in, in that position so I, I like the idea that alistair becomes king and actually ends up uh just killing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's always the people who don't want the job who end up being the best at it. The fact yeah. that he doesn't want to become king is what makes him a good one, I think. So yeah, right. You know. I mean, nobody wants someone who wants to. I mean, those people end right. up being dictators, and then we've seen what happens there. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a great question. Angelina Joy Douthit from Facebook would like to know what was the yes. most challenging thing for you about the process of voicing him? Diving in, uh, diving in, not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm such a control freak that I like to prepare. Mm -hmm. And there is no preparation because I don't know when I go to the studio every day what's going to happen, where mm -hmm. it's going to go. So th there can be no preparation. Your preparation is the second before you say the line. So you Maybe. didn't even know what you were going to record the next day. You would no. literally come in and they'd hand you There's the. There's no way. I mean, if they'd handed me the papers which are this thing and say go home and look at this and get an idea about it i think i would it would have blown my mind and also it would have been overwhelming yeah so you just you just do it a line at a time and eventually you get to the end of the you get to the end of the pile which is really a, a feeling of a, a of accomplishment every single day mm -hmm. because when you walk in the room and it's there you just say, like, no way i'm gonna get through all this right but it's you know it's also that it's a oh my gosh it's just um the the yeah, the feeling of accomplishment, but also just kind of the learning to let go and trust your instrument is mm -hmm. the biggest lesson, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I love this next question. You're going to love it, too. Yeah. Ali, otherwise known as Genocidal Fetus on Twitter. I love oh, that. Lovely Hello. name. Lovely name. Hello, Ali. <laughs> How do you feel about the spicy fanfics that are out there about Alistair? And uh, have you ever read any of them? Uh, I, a few, a few have been sent to me over the years. Uh, yes, and I've seen some of the hacks as well, which were interesting. They show up on YouTube. Um, great, go for it. <laughs> it's all good. Whatever you need, you know, take it from. Uh, I love that idea because 
it, it means that in many it, the, the game succeeded the character succeeded you want to yeah. do stuff with the character that means it works and that's right. the greatest compliment of all if you want to take it and put it in the direction you'd love to see great if you want to take if you want to write about the character doing some things awesome i mean that just means right. to me that it works and it's appreciated and we all just want to do stuff that's appreciated i so, think that's the greatest I, I, just don't, I don't think it's salacious enough <laughs> <laughs> there's a challenge but uh yeah i've seen i've seen a few pieces and a bit mm. pieces, yeah. let's just say that it moves well beyond lamp posts that's all yes, i know it does yeah um, <laughs> but um Thebes would like to know Thebes g from twitter do you can uh, do you plan to continue to lend your voice to more video game characters i mean you're you know uh, you've you've done yeah. uh, some of that but i know you're primarily on you know stage and screen and mostly tv but uh you know do you, would you do more of it yeah, if it comes along, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Um, uh, there's there's been a few near misses job wise, but um, I yeah I, I would like to do it again. My, um, there's something that might happen in the, in the next month or so that I can't talk about. There will be a, a, an audio for, uh, for a video game, but fingers crossed that that all works out. But uh, yeah, we'll cross I our would. fingers. It's, it's, you know, it's the best job in the world, really, um, because you, it's like a nine to five. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's creative. It's, you, you get up, like I said, you get up, you show up in your pajamas and it's just the best. Um, and it's a good team and it's, it's always very uh, relaxed and creative. And yeah, I actually love doing it. Um, being, uh, this is from Lumi, being, Hi, a Lumi. Voice, being a voice actor and an actor, uh, which do you like the most? Do you have a preference? I, um, I like whatever I'm doing at the moment. So, you know, but then I always want to do something else. So if I'm doing a comedy, I really want to do a drama. If I'm doing a drama, I'd love to do a comedy. If I'm doing a voice, I'd love to do something on camera. If I'm on camera, I'd love to do a voice. Cause I'm, so it, it's uh, that's just part of my nature. I'm kind of a very much kind of like, okay, what's next, what's next? But um, I have no preference. Uh, uh, no, whether if I'm doing like, an, uh, like an, an intense adult piece or something like Monster High, which is so large and, 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 and these large, larger than life characters, uh, it's all just fun. It's all mm -hmm. just play. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky in that I get to do the things that, uh, that I want, although I work hard for it, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, very lucky. I feel very lucky to be, mm -hmm. to be involved in any of this really. A uh, question for you. Uh, do you, no. do you ever feel like uh, moving outside of acting into, for instance, directing or producing, or have you done that, or would you do more of it? I've produced, yeah. So I, I, I have four projects that I've created and written that we're pitching. Uh, um, mm -hmm. One is a comic book that's a kind of a superhero comic book that that I sold to Aftershock Comics. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, it's called Super. It's a um, pretty unusual um, comic book story, superhero story. Uh, that uh, is exciting. We've already got some of the artwork in on that. Um, I wrote a conspiracy theory show, which I just attached a showrunner to. So we'll pitch that in the new year. I have a comedy, which I've attached some talent to. And I produced, um, although I had a, a small hand in it, uh, uh, years ago, I got the rights to a series of books called The Gourmet Detective. And we mm -hmm. uh, um, wrote the pilot for USA Network and it didn't go. Um, and then, uh, so I got the rights back and I was pitching it. Eventually we pitched it to Hallmark and we sold it as a series of movies based each one based on the novel um and uh and so i think we've made five of them so far i'm an executive producer on that although i don't have a lot of hands-on work in it it's more like the creative side of it and mm -hmm. getting it getting it out there and getting it sold so that was that was an education mm -hmm. um yeah no i'm i'm kind of one of those guys who uh, uh has my hands in a lot of different pies right so mm -hmm. i love writing creating the comic book to write a comic book is such a different um beast right because when i write a script i can oh i can cut to this i can cut to this we can do this i can have these long speeches it mm. doesn't work that way in comics everything has to be very succinct and visual mm. and so it took me a little while to kind of to to learn the mm. uh teach myself the techniques of, uh, of of being a comic book but i have a tendency to do this why well, just jump in first and then i'll ask questions on the way down um and uh Otherwise, if I'm if I wait at home until I learn something and I know everything about it, I'll never get anything done. So that's kind of how I. And sometimes that bites me in the butt, by the way. But on the whole, yeah. So now I'm also learning um, uh, 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 book writing. So my plan is to take one of my uh, one of my scripts that's already kind of developed and and turn that into a novella because I think it would be really interesting as as a novella. 
Now, as in terms of writing, you're you also have a one man show, correct? That you've, yeah, that I you've do. Developed, I, yeah. and you wrote yeah. that, right? So yeah, that was the uh, Life and Other Deceptions, which we did. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, like five six years ago. Um, that was interesting because it was. I'm always telling like stories of my life and career to, to friends when we're at dinner, you know, everyone, we're all telling stories. And my, my mate said to me, Chris, he was like, you know, you should put these in a, this is one man's yeah. show. Stuff. Should, and I'm like, yeah, but it's all like one man show is it's such a narcissistic venture, isn't it? Cause it's like, it's a one man show and it's about me and it's I, 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 and I did this and I did that. And nobody, so the challenge was to, um, to write a one man show about my life in a way that an audience can relate to it. And, mm -hmm. and especially kind of the story was me coming to Hollywood and all these various things that happened um, mm -hmm. and magic and how magic and acting kind of collided and um, imploded in some ways. And so, uh, but it was, that was again, jumping in, you know, we thought we'd kickstart the budget and I thought, well, I'll write it if we get the money mm -hmm. and then we got the money. And then I was like, shit, okay, now I've got to write it. <laughs> Um, and, uh, the original script was three hours long mm -hmm. I think, and we edited it down to a two and a half hour, one man show mm -hmm. with an act break in the middle. Um, and for me, I think the hardest part of that was the learning, writing, learning my own words. Mm -hmm. like when I learn somebody else's words, it's kind of, it's easier when I learn what I've written and I know that I can change anything, mm -hmm. um, then it becomes a little harder, but, um, uh, it was, I'm actually retooling it and rewriting it right now. So for a 90 minute, I want to do it as a one, as a 90 minute special. Because I, I wanted to ask you, if, yeah, yeah, if there's any chance we can see it someday. So there's, there's not that much out there as far there's a lot of comedy stand up specials, but there's very few magic specials and, mm -hmm. uh, Derek Delgadio did a great one for Hulu. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I feel like it's a world that, that is, uh, has not been fed. And so I, I think we can go there. So that's, that's one of my plans in the new year. Yeah, you know, COVID permitting, of course. I'm going to get to your magic because we have a lot of questions about that, but I'm going to jump yeah. first to a couple of questions about your TV work. Um, yeah. Renee Burton, uh, Hi, Renee. Mentions she loves Monk and Chuck and Supergirl and absolutely yeah. adores Psych, um, especially uh, I, Billy. I, she loves Billy Lips. Billy Lips rocks. And she wants to know, boy. is there a guest appearance that was just so much fun for you that if they called you and said, Steve, you've got to reprise this appearance, that you would say yes immediately? Immediately, I, absolutely. And that would be, that would be psych. The, the, the working on that show it was the hundredth episode. It was a satire of, um, of Clue, the movie mm -hmm. with almost the entire cast, mm -hmm. you know, a Martin Mull, Christopher Lloyd, Christopher Lloyd, like, uh, all, everyone that was mm -hmm. in that. And then, and then your two main guys in that show are probably the best actors I've ever worked with in the realm of do what you want to Steve upstage us. If you've got something funny, let us know. We don't care if you're funnier than us, as long as it makes the scene better. They're, they're, they're egoless, I guess is the way that I'm, and, and I've done shows literally where I've got a laugh and I've come in the next day and the line was cut because the lead was like, he's funnier than me. Oh, no. These guys are the opposite, which is why there was a lot of improvisation in that. There was a lot of, um, moments where we just kind of went with it and they, mm -hmm. and, and they embrace that. They know that all the, that everybody has something to, to contribute. But for me, so that role that the arc of Billy lips was really interesting. And, mm -hmm. uh, but for me, just the best memory of that was, uh, just talking to Chris Lloyd on our off time, we were filming in a casino or near a casino in, in uh, Vancouver and the, um, Chris and I decided to go get, go to, I'm just going to go to the bar and get Coke or something like that. So as we walk into the casino, the security guy, and I'll never forget this, he's like this, this huge, huge guy. And he's like, let's see your ID, please. You know, we're like, come on, we're over 21. I'm going to see your ID. Mm -hmm. um, so I show my ID and then Chris, and he doesn't recognize. Mm -hmm. Chris Lloyd. I mean, I guess it would be just kind of in the middle of nowhere. Suddenly right. you know, the lawyer walks in, what, you know? So um, Chris goes in first and I, and I turn to the security guy and I'm like, you know who that is, don't you? And he goes, what? I go, you know who that is? And he goes, oh. I said, that's, that's Doc Brown. That's Chris Lloyd, that's Doc Brown. And he goes, what? And he looks at him. <laughs> and I know, I, he was just a big tough exterior. And he, see, he looks at him and he realizes that's Doc Brown. And he literally went like this. 
I get a picture. I mean, it was just like he became a five-year-old boy right before yeah. my eyes. And that was, that's the beauty of, that, of being an actor. And and just watching people's reactions wherever we went with, mm -hmm. with Chris was just, it was such a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, and the, the shooting that was amazing. And also it was written by a guy who was a script assistant when I did Crossing Jordan. Oh, so we talk great. about coming full circle where he'd got to the point where he's writing, now he's writing for Psych and now the you know, 100th episode is a big deal. He gets to write that and it was very intricate. There's a lot of storylines going on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would, I would do Psych anytime, anytime. I love hearing that, that that's someone that you work with early in your career and, and, and they kind of moved up, you know, and you got to be part of it. So and that's what happens when yeah. you bump into people like the guy from Mattel, who was like, we did a pilot together 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, you know, um, Jeanette had another question about psych. Yeah. For you. She wanted to ask, uh, what was it like working on it? I mean, you, obviously they were generous and fun and exciting to work with anything that, you know, that you didn't mention that you'd like to bring up. I think that, um, uh, no, I mean, it, 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 was, it was that, that way, but also the, the, the crew was a family. I think they've been shooting the show, gosh, I want to say 10 years, but maybe not. But uh, it felt that way. I mean, Supernatural was that way. Supernatural was, mm -hmm. the, the, everyone was such a tight family. Um, and this was too, like there was, but there was a lot of humor on the set. There was a lot of, uh, uh, everyone was very really relaxed and doing their job, but professional and slick and just kind mm -hmm. of everyone knew what they were doing. It was, it was just a, it was like butter. Um, I do remember one other thing. Oh, it's funny because on camera we had a great time. Uh, and, uh, a lot of the improvisation was great. And some of it got kept in like dropping the pants and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but which is just something I try and do in every film I, I do, but, um, there was a night when uh, Kurt Smith, who was in the uh, who was in the show as well from Tears for Fears, Kurt was playing himself in the in the episode, mm -hmm. and we were off, uh, and we were all going to meet out later for karaoke. The whole crew, they love doing karaoke, by the way. And um, but it was Kurt and I were off early, so I said, "Let's let's go to karaoke early," because I've always wanted to do karaoke with someone who's a rock star, because right, I'm right. a real rock star, not a yeah. you know, mock star, but a rock star, yeah. and. Um, and so I convinced him to, to come with, so we went to this, uh, and, and in this karaoke place, there was like one table, it was like four Chinese guys at one table who uh, who decided that it felt like it was a competition between the two of us. It was their table versus our table. And uh, and there was just this wonderful moment when, when Kirk got up and started singing, uh, uh, everybody wants to rule the world. And I'm like, this is the most, they had no idea it was the him. most surreal it, thing I can imagine. It is. Awesome. Yes. It was so bizarre. And I filmed it and he, he made me swear not to put it online. And now I'm searching everywhere for it because damn it, it's time to put it online. But I, um, I got to find that somewhere, but he was great. Yeah. I mean, to get up and do his own song in karaoke was, uh, yeah, that, that was, that was killer. Well, now I have to ask you, what is your go-to karaoke be piece? What's your, you know, what's one you always end up doing? Uh, if I want to really end the evening, um, then it will be Gethsemane. Uh, from, oh. You know, because there's a point where that just gets so high, it's ridiculous and it doesn't work. And everyone's like, okay, I think that's the end of the karaoke night. Well, what um, a way to go. That's a good one. You've got to go out and Gethsemane, you know, yeah. and... Uh, yeah, that's my, I mean, that's my old time. Although right now I play a lot of rock stars and, um, I don't have like the big rock screamy voice. And so I'm in singing lessons right now. I'm taking a regular, cause I, I feel like I want to get there. So to get, mm -hmm. that's why I get many is again, part of that. But I'm right now I'm learning, uh, um, the King's role from, uh, from Hamilton. Um, Oh my, that, yeah. that would be awesome. We you would be amazing. So. Yeah, so I kind of fun. love that. I love that song. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's hard not to do it the way that it was done, but, uh, you know, you kind of want to put your own spin on it, but that's, that's kind of where I'm, what I'm learning right now. You were doing amazing. You'll be back. That would be great. Yeah. So. That's what we're doing. Yeah. It's, it gets pretty high at one point. So, um, did you ever do any musicals? Like, did you ever do Jesus Christ Superstar? You know, or... no, when I was younger, uh, when, uh, I was in a theater. Well, yes, yes, I did. Uh, not Jesus Christ, but when I was younger, I, I, I was in a theater group called the Proscenium Company in England, and we had, uh, we would be, uh, we would learn, we'd do an all-time musical, which is kind of like a Victorian variety show, which has a very specific format, mm -hmm. um, and there will be songs and dances and monologues and comedy bits and sketches, and those were always fun. We we often did it at the at the Players Music Hall Theater in London, which was 
so much fun. And then we would do, I did a rock musical called Moulin Rouge back in, I want to say, so my dad's story, so it was like 82, Jesus. Um, oh, and uh, where I played, it was my favorite role because I played Valentin uh, in the Moulin Rouge. If you see the posters, you see the, mm -hmm. um, uh, the guy with the top hat with the silhouette, huge nose, top hat, very angular. His name was Valentin. And he was uh, actually very handsome, but Lautrec hated him. So because he was gay and he liked men, whereas Lautrec liked women, and yet women would throw themselves at Valentin and he wasn't interested. And there was all this kind of, so Valentin would, uh, would be painted in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and he was known as the boneless. And so he did the can can. So when I did Moulin Rouge, I had to do the can can. And that was, uh, and that's, yeah, and that was one of my all time favorite roles. I mean, just being able to jump up down into the splits. Mm -hmm. um, what was I, 16, I think. And then wow. uh, somewhere along those lines. That was such a great role. And that's where I got my name from because Valentine isn't my real last name. Mm -hmm. That's great, though. Um... And then yeah. Z has another question for you. To play Nigel in Crossing Jordan, loved Nigel, by the way, so much. Thank you. Um, you yeah. had to pronounce a lot of medical terms. Did you have a favorite medical term and what does it mean? So, well, um, there was, uh, when you do it, uh, uh, it's be careful what you do well, uh, because suddenly everything will get thrown at you. And that was mm -hmm. what happened was like, they gave me a scene. And I think I had to say something like urate to try to toxin or something like that. <laughs> I can say now. Yeah. And they were like, oh, Steve's good with that dialogue. But let's just give that all to him. And then Miguel, God bless him, Miguel Ferrer would be like, I don't want to say this, Steve. You want to say this? <laughs> I was such a line whore. I'd be like, absolutely. Give me more dialogue. I want to be on camera more. And um, and then it was like, be, be careful. But we had one two page, I think maybe three page monologue, one episode, which was oh. this crazy speech about how a, a, a sweater had been soaked in heroin or cocaine and that's how they they transported it from mexico and then there was this chemical combination that would dissolve the sweater and just leave you with the cocaine and it was all most of the stuff on the show was based on fact this was the most this was jumping the shark but <laughs> i had to learn this speech so as soon as i got as soon as i got the the um the script i worked my ass off on it every night and usually i would do it on the on the treadmill because uh, i like to we did a lot of walk and talks on that show and walking and talking and doing dialogue is another hot, one of the hardest things you can do. So for me, it was like, I was running. With it. So I was very well prepared, expecting to do it at the end of the shoot, the schedule show. And then one day, I think two days, three days into it, they were like, Hey, we've had a schedule change. Could we do this scene right now? Do you want it? And, and I remember I had it down pretty good, but I remember going like, uh, Oh guys, guys, I haven't, I haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> can I get, can I get three minutes in the trailer, mm -hmm. you know? And so <laughs> it was my like, all right, you're going to throw this at me. Right. Okay. And then I came back in and we, we, we did it. And, um, and then everyone was like, whoa, that was amazing. He left, give him more. And it was, gee, it was like, that. yeah, now I can say it all. The good thing about having an English accent is that you can say any long phrase and it sounds like, you know, what you're talking about. It's true. And that's kind of what I relied on, to be honest with you. You could say anything, actually, and you sound, you know, it more than the rest of us, smarter than the rest of us. It's great. So. Yeah, faking it till you make it. Well, speaking of being a, of, of being a Brit, Julia yeah. has a question for you. If the BBC were to call you tomorrow and offer you the role of the new doctor or the new master, which would you pick? Oh. <laughs> that's a tough one. I've always wanted to play the doctor. I've always wanted to do that. Um, It'd be great, by the way. I I would love. I would bring. There's so much I'd want to bring to it. Mm -hmm. I'd love to bring this element of just joy and fun back. Um, I'm such a huge fan of the franchise. I would do any role in in the. Yeah, you know, I'd play a bloody Dalek if it came up. But I think <laughs> that uh, I, I, given the choice of the master and the doctor, mm -hmm. hands down, I'd want to play the doctor. And it's a. And knowing that it is an incredibly demanding role, if you really look at the scripts, and I mean, Matt Smith, just the stuff that he would, I mean, it's going on and on and on and on. These monologues, you're talking about monologues, mm -hmm. and it's fast, and it's all this other action going on, and, and there's so much involved in it. I just, um, it would be this incredible challenge to do, mm -hmm. and it would be an honor to do, because it's, you know, when you, 
it's like when you meet someone from your childhood. So I, I just doing Monster High and uh, I've never felt so proud and so old in the exact same moment when like the, the cast, uh, as we were saying goodbye to everyone, and each one of them would say like, I didn't want to say anything during production, but I loved watching you and I'm in the band when I was a kid. Um, oh, you know, or you inspired me as an act. One, one, one of the cast said to me, um, I had a garage band because of Iron Weasel. Oh. And, and you just kind of go, this is amazing, you know, but at the same time, I feel so old. When someone says to you, you were part of my childhood um, growing up, on television uh it's it's simultaneously a prideful and <laughs> slightly <laughs> and everything else it. yeah um we've been doing it for so bloody long and i feel that way about doctor who i mm -hmm. feel like it would be it's such a part of my childhood that it would be so surreal so i'd do anything on doctor who but yeah mm -hmm. to play the doctor would be hands down a bucket list thing well I think we need to make that happen. We should, you know, we should boost the signal on that. I believe so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Isabella would like to know if you have any uh, upcoming projects that you want to uh, talk about or that you're really excited about particularly or? Just just right now, the, the Monster High franchise has been really interesting to see uh, because it's the first big Nick Films Mattel collaboration, I believe. And so it's been very interesting to see everyone come together to take something that is beloved Mm -hmm. and to make something new out of it but still uh respects and honors the the you know the, the original so I, I that's been there's so much care and love that's gone into that film and this franchise and they worked on it for so long to, to bring it to where it is now and the music in that although i'm not singing a song in this I, the music is so good um wow. i already played it for my kids and my, my daughter's running around singing the songs so it's really it's really good so that's been great who knows what the new year will hold um mm -hmm. i'd love to get one of my shows up and running that would be kind of the ideal thing see the first issue of the comic book come out i'd love to do a tour with the illusionist again or kind of do my own one-man show in new york mm -hmm. um end of the year i have uh, i'm gonna bring the one-man show back in uh, in pittsburgh we're gonna kind of, we're gonna do it at liberty magic in pittsburgh and kind of put it back on his feet um that i'm looking forward to um who knows right i mean 2022 the only thing i love about 2022 is all your ducks right all the two right. all the twos 22 two little ducks as i say in bingo so i feel like 2022 all the ducks are in a row for everybody so maybe we'll come out of this in a positive in a positive light it certainly seems that way report early reports on the you know the omicron are that it's not as harsh as delta but it's taking over delta and that could be mm -hmm. That could be great for everybody, you know. Fingers crossed. I yeah, let's let's here's to a better 2022 for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um Debbie has a lovely question for you. Uh would, Hi, Debbie. Um, would like to know what advice uh, would you give to someone uh interested in getting into voice acting? Do you know it's funny? I was I was working at, uh I was on a Disney cruise and there's a great comedy act called Buckets and Boards, and one of the guys on that was asking me the same question and and it was it 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 it's tough. I said, just you just got to do it. You got to set up a home studio, especially more now than ever. You need to get like a little home studio and make and just um, do a whole bunch of voices, uh, record them, listen, play them back, mm -hmm. figure out what it is. Do you want to do natural? Do you want to do singing? Do you want to do cartoon voices? What are the things that you're working on? But then, and then put yourself uh, put together a little reel, and then you have to just send it out to to agents. You have to find the agents online, and cold call and and um but also nowadays there's so much casting now is looking so much online for talent mm -hmm. youtube is has become um and obviously TikTok have, mm -hmm. have become kind of major portals for talent directors and casting directors to, to find the next stars of tomorrow um it's funny i, I was working with i learned more about the internet and uh, i don't want to sound like an old fogey i learned more about TikTok instagram uh from the kids in monster high especially uh case case walker who is incredibly talented who started on musically when musically before it became you know TikTok. um just i mean i learned the history of all of this stuff and kind of how sean mendez at one point was part of that and then decided to move away and kind of focus on his career with his label and look where he is and you know so you uh, i feel like the world is your oyster now uh we 
there are, there are gatekeepers, but you can very easily go around them. It's not like it used to be. And just so just I would say use I'm totally spitballing here off the top of my head. But in my opinion, if I was going to start out fresh, I would say use everything that we have. Yeah. TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, be seen, make your own content. I was in uh, Vancouver and I met up with a friend of mine and he said, I, I'm, I'm getting into acting now. And I was like, oh, great, good. And, he, and, he, and he's like, can I show you my reel? I've been doing some work. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a three minute reel. There was about eight different characters on there, eight different projects, I think two television and film. Um, and each role was so great and different. Each scene was, showed a different side of him, makeup, accent. And at the end of it, I was, I was like, but I haven't heard of any of these projects. And I was like, did you make this yourself? He was like, yeah, yeah. So he got a whole bunch of friends in. He, he knows cinematography. He knows lighting. He taught himself. He, he found locations. He had friends in to come do scenes. They got the scene as well. And it was literally just that one 30 second clip, not even the whole scene, just maybe he set the whole thing up. So he got the hero shot as he walked in. That was it. But he made the entire thing himself, made it look like a professional production, um, put the credits on, you know, and, and he said, some, sometimes he sent it out to a few casting directors and they've he's had a couple of meetings and they're like, I think I, I think I saw that on, on that <laughs> one movie, completely faked the whole thing. It's a business about faking it. So that's great yeah. though. I love it. Yeah. Really great. I mean, we can do that. So why not, uh, why not do that with voice? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the, the key is, like you say, is getting out there. Just get yourself out there in whatever way you can. Do it. No one's going to, you know, it's the old line about buy a ticket. It's you just, you've got to, you've got to do it. You've got to get out there and, and uh, dive in and you'll learn more by doing it and uh, than anything else. Don't listen when <laughs> someone says, if someone says, ah, oh, no, it's no good or you're never going to do anything. I used to, you know, I came from a small village in England called South End on Sea and we, I can't tell you how many people would say to me like, oh, Steve thinks he's going to be an actor. Oh, he's going to go to Hollywood, you know, and you just have to believe that you can do it. Not in an arrogant way, but you just kind of have to have a certain sense of uh, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I remember this one, one guy I was in an acting class before I got crossing Jordan and this one actor saying to me, I can't ask you a question. He said, do you really think you're going to work in Hollywood? And I was like, yeah, at some point, somewhere. He said, well, you're, you're not exactly a type, are you? And I, and I remember thinking, well, Jack Nicholson became his own type. And maybe I'll become my own type. Jack Nicholson couldn't get work for a while, but then the right role came along. So I was like, yeah, I think the right role will come along at some point. Mm -hmm. And he said, look at me. He said, he says, he says uh, I'm short, I'm fat, I'm kind of nebbishy. He goes, I can play lawyers, doctors, judges. He says, the whole world is open to me. He said, uh, you're tall and I was really skinny at that point. Skinny, you've got big forehead, big ears. He said, uh, long hair. He said, you don't exactly fit much that's on television. And I'm like, literally, just like, what the? <laughs> this guy is saying to me. Um, and he says, do you really think you're, you know, and I'm like, yes, at some point, something will come along. And when it does, it'll be special. Mm -hmm. And it will stand out as opposed to blend into a bunch of other characters. Maybe a year and a half later, I got Crossing Jordan and, uh, it was that role. It was that role where when I went to audition for it, um, it was a guest star for literally guest star recurring. And then by the second, I think or third episode, they were like, we're going to make Steve a series regular on this. And that guy came in as a guest star playing a doctor. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, in the first season. Now I ask you, what would you do? Like how, <laughs> how, how would you respond? Right. And I, and I thought you just, success is its own revenge. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, I was grace, gracious and showed him around the set. I was like, welcome to the show, man. Let me show you around. This is this, this is this. And then just at the very end of it, I was like, got to run to my trailer, but I'll see you on set. And it was, just, <laughs> it was just, you know, but it was, oh my God, the universe gave that to me because that was such a, and maybe that was the universe saying, are you sure you want this? Because you know, messages come all the time, right? Uh, but so don't listen to naysayers, you know, believe in yourself. Yeah, and fortune favors the brave. You have to, it really takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there and, uh, you know, you don't know if you don't try, so. You don't, you know, you don't want to be on your deathbed going, oh, what if, 
oh, what if I just, you know, give it a shot? Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So I, I love hearing that. Um, now, I finally am excited to ask you some questions about your magic. Um, oh, right, the magic. Uh, <laughs> well, this is, an, an, and uh, do you have a few more minutes, Steve? Are we okay on yeah, time? Yeah, no, that's, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, when did you first fall in love with magic and what was the moment for you? Uh, I, I, I was, um, well, there's two stories, both true. One's a little inappropriate. Uh, so I was five years old. And a kid did a trick for me in the, in the playground and made a knot disappear on a piece of rope. And I, would, and I just pestered him until he showed me how it was done. And then I remember telling my uncle about it, Michael Dave, and he had a book called The Royal Road to Card Magic. And he said to me, it was a year or two later, he would do this one trick where he would take a card. He would take a card and he would put it like over there and then pull it out from over here or something right that was kind of the way that he would do it and or he would say point to a point point to a place and he would reach over and he would pull the card out from that place and blew me away and he said it's in this book the secret is in this book i'm gonna loan this to you until i see you like a month or two from now and he said so if you can find it you can learn it which i thought was great as opposed to just showing like earn it right and um i read the entire book back to front and it wasn't in the book. And so I went back to him and I'm like, I can't find it. And he goes, you mean you read the whole book? I'm like, yeah, it's not in the book. Uh, and and that, that was kind of the real moment. And then I was, uh, my parents had, uh, had to have some surgery when I was seven or eight, seven or eight years old. And I remember my parents, there, there was something they decided to get done while I was in hospital, but they didn't tell me about. <laughs> I don't get to details, but I remember waking up and being kind of freaked out. They felt so guilty about it. They bought me the biggest magic set of all. So I remember being in the, in the hospital with this giant magic set and, uh, uh, and that being kind of the whole story will be told in the new edition of life Another deception. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah. And so that's, but I, I was very lucky. I, I started putting, uh, I, I read a lot. My local library had magic books. And then I entered this competition when I was 10 that when the movie Magic came out with Anthony Hopkins and it was playing at the local Odeon Theatre and to promote it, they had a magic competition. And I didn't know anyone else who did magic. I was like the only kid at my school. And, um, and, I, and I remember walking into this competition, this magic competition, where part of the prize was tickets to see the movie. And just magicians everywhere, props everywhere. And it was like, one of us, right? It was just that moment of, oh my God, there's other people in my hometown who do magic. And there was this little old man called Dick Turpin. He was an old, he was 80 then. He was like a street performer, been a street performer his entire life. And he was so kind of like cheeky and funny and lovely. And he said to me, you know, he said, have you heard of the South End Sorcerer Society? And I was like, no, and he goes, oh, you, he said, well, it's adults only, but we can talk to them um, about it. He says, you should come. And so I got invited and, and then, so, so Dick Turpin became kind of my mentor for a little bit. And, uh, and I became part of that club and then it just, it just grew. So it's been, it's been a passion and a love for years. That's wonderful that you've, you, you found that acceptance and you found kind of your place. Yeah, I did. And it's an amazing hobby for that. Mm -hmm. You can learn magic as we have more hobbyists and amateur than we do professionals, because wherever you go in the world, you will find a, a kindred spirit. You go to what I used to do was go to a local magic shop find a person, you know, what's going on magically in town. And they would tell you, invite you into their fold. And, and then I quit doing it um, for 10 years because it was interfering with my ability to get acting jobs because I could, I would go to an audition and then the casting director or the producer would be like, well, I saw you at the Magic Castle or you did my kid's birthday party. <laughs> Why are you here? And I'm like, I'm here to play the killer. You know, they couldn't take me uh, seriously. I, I really felt that. And the, this producer called Ray Stark was, lovely guy, a big, big producer invited me to his house, saw me at the magic castle. And I'd done a few guest stars at that spot at that time. And he invited me to his house to talk about a movie. And I remember thinking, this is, this is it. This is, oh, this is great. And so I go, it was the weirdest night. It was uh, the year that American pie came out. And for some, he, he had a first run uh, film of it that we had to watch the screening with all these kind of strange hangers on. Um, and it was a really weird movie to watch with this kind of legendary producer. And then everyone goes home and it's him and me. And he hands me a script uh, and he goes, this is what I want to talk to you about. And it was Houdini. Oh, he was wow. going to remake Houdini. And I believe he had the Tom Cruise was going to play Houdini, although 
I'm not entirely sure. That's kind of my memory of it, but it might be a little twisted. Obviously the movie didn't get made, but he wanted me to um, be the magic consultant for it. Wow. Like, That's great, but can I have a role in the film? You know, it was like just yeah. a couple of lines somewhere. And he was like, no, what are you talking about? You're a magician. You know, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm an actor. And he goes, mm, yeah, sure. Magician, actor, model, actress. Yeah, sure. And, and so he said, he said to me, you've got to decide what you want to be. And, and in this town, people see you one way. And right. so it was very difficult, but I ended up uh, uh, quitting magic for mm -hmm. a good 10 years. And, and, um, and then I started, strangely started to work and it was kind of a Rosemary's Baby kind of situation. And anytime magic came up, I would completely deny it. In fact, in Crossing Jordan, there's a scene as a Nigel does a card trick. And mm -hmm. I used to have the produ one of the network executives would be like, you did, I saw you at a Christmas party a couple of years ago. I mean, it was Army Bernstein's uh, holiday party. And I was like, it wasn't me. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't do magic. And, and he's like, no, 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 I, I, I saw you. And I'm like, no, nah, want me. And he comes in with my business card, right? It's Steve Valentine, sparkling hocus pocus. And, and I was like, nah, that's another Steve Valentine, tall English guy. Yeah, it looks a lot like me, but it's not me. And they just looked at me like I was, so anytime magic came up, I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not a magician. I'm an actor. I'm not a magician. And when they forced me to do that card trick, I did it as badly as possible. So they wouldn't have me do it again. Oh. <laughs> um, I kind of relented a little bit years later and I think House was the first time I played a magician on and then we did Monk a number of years later mm -hmm. after that but uh yeah but it was doing um filming Avalon High in New Zealand that was the first time that I'd gone back to a magic shop in some 10 years and wow. uh and it turned out and this is what the show is about there was a guy in the store who was a magician from the South End Sorcerer Society back when I was a kid in New Zealand. And he'd moved wow. his family there. And uh, he didn't recognize me, but I recognized him. And um, and he had video of the whole, like, of the whole club, you know? And it was just kind of like, okay, universal messages. Okay, we're getting the message back. And mm -hmm. so that was when I kind of embraced it, created the show, which was my whole way of saying, I'm a magician and an actor. We can do everything. and. Mm -hmm. And, and then shortly after that, I created Magic on the Go because it was my, I just, there was just this flood of creativity that had been held back for 10 years mm -hmm. and I wanted to put it online. Did it I wanted feel to create like, a database. Did it feel like coming home, you know, to return to Magic? Yeah, it did. And what was crazy, and I'll never forget it, I'd not gone to the Magic Castle, which is this club in Hollywood mm -hmm. for magicians, beautiful. That's and it's scary. got such a great history. Yeah. I, I'd worked there for so many years and I quit going there as well. And I remember going back one night thinking like, okay, I'm going to, they're probably going to be like, no, no one's going to remember me. And if they do, they're going to be like, oh, you think you're too big to come back? And you, and I walk in and I remember Milt Larson, who was the, um, the, the owner. I see him at the bar and he says, Steve? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, where you been lad? Let me buy you a drink. And that was beautiful. You know, it was like this whole kind of like, and then it was, I was back and, uh, I'm able to do all of it now. And I think maybe that's just the universe now in show business, you kind of expect it to do so much more, you, 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 you know, because of social media and all these other things. And, um, but back then I felt you had to be on the right. straight and narrow, choose a career, go that way. Um, and now it's, I love it. I do all of it. And if anybody has a problem with that, then they can switch off. You know what I mean? It's kind of that thing about, uh, like do the things that you want to do because you want to do them, not because anyone else, uh, thinks you should or shouldn't mm -hmm. big lesson for me um, i love that i was going to ask what what's your favorite thing about being a magician what do you love the most about it i love well there's two things i love i love doing a magic trick with someone who doesn't know i do magic uh, like a, an obscure moment a beat you know if you do like a little levitation in the middle of a bar or something and everyone's freaking out because like wait a minute what just happened mm -hmm. but um for me there is a sense of uh there's, a, I know a lot of magicians will use this, but I really mean this. There's a sense of wonder that you can, uh, uh, there were, when I was, I was toying with the illusionists right before, uh, the lockdown and I can't tell you the grown up, grown up men and women that will come up to me and say, I felt like a kid again. That was mm -hmm. amazing. I got in touch with this sense of anything is possible. Mm -hmm. And I love making people laugh and I love amazing people and just kind of, kind of short circuiting the, uh, the, the psyche a little bit because it's, I, I think we need to believe that stuff is possible. Yeah. 
when I, I wrote a treatment for a show based on the life of Joe Nichol, who's the only, one of the, I think he's the only full-time paranormal investigator in the world. And Joe is a skeptic, a real skeptic. And so he has investigated everything from the Shroud of Turin to, I mean, you name it, vampires in the heartland, everything. And so it was really interesting because it didn't work. I realized as I was putting this thing together because you had to have a character in the show that that was that had some kind of psychic ability. Otherwise, or you're or you're just Debbie Downer the entire time, right? You're just saying, yeah, there is no hope, there is no God, there is no spirituality, there is no supernatural. There's nothing that we can, there's no mystery in life, and so it ended up just being a show about someone saying doesn't exist, doesn't exist, <laughs> and. And in the end, I kind of dropped it because I realized that you, we want to believe that there is more and we want to believe that something does exist. And so I don't think very existential here, but I think that's with magic and in, in that we just kind of, I can't tell you at a time that someone will go, I just, there has to be something more going on here. You can't have mm-hmm. just done that. You know, what, what, what's got actually, and so you create this sense of wonder and mystery and I love it. Yeah. And oh. it transcends every language. You know, yeah. it's visual, you can do it anyway. Well, and I think the key, it's interesting that we call it magic and it's, it's trickery. It's, it's beautiful sleight of hand and trickery and all this, an illusion, but yeah. he is magic, right? I believe it, that it's magic. I mean, I'll see you do something and, you know, I don't know how that worked. I don't want to know how it worked. You when know? you watch a movie or you play a video game or you listen to an audio book, I mean, you're not always going, well, the guy's in the studio. It's like you, you, oh, you yeah. release that sense of disbelief. And, and I think with magic, we do that. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, a good magician will hopefully send you into that into that place, mm-hmm. and it's good for the soul, you know. Uh, which magicians inspired you the most? There was a guy called David Dixon when I was a kid who was an English. It was kind of he had a TV show um, for many many years, and he was like you know, the lovely kind uncle who would do magic, and he looked like he was in his drawing room. And then Paul, and then following him was a guy called Paul Daniels. Mm-hmm. So those two were my childhood growing up. And I got to meet Paul, who was also in New Zealand at a magic convention, because I got invited to go to this magic convention after I met Brian in the magic shop. Uh, and I met Paul Daniels, who was my childhood hero. And we talk about messages wow. from the universe. And we, I got to know him really well um, a couple of years before he died. And that was really special. So those guys are my heroes. And then I remember watching David Copperfield's first television special and just loving the where he took it with mm-hmm. music and theater. And, and he's just one of the greatest magicians in the world. And I think the mm-hmm. work he puts into everything he has put into everything he's done is, is inspiring. What was your first successful magic trick that you were the most proud of? Uh, I remember taking the principal's coat at school at assembly one day and sticking a knife through it and uh, i'm watching the kids just the horror on their faces you know oh my god he's, he's gonna get detention and then it worked there's no rip in the coat and and that was uh his face uh all the teachers faces because they didn't believe i could pull it off um that was probably one of the best moments yeah so the principal in the day. Saw you do it what's that the principal saw you do it? Yeah, he was holding the coat. The trick is they hold out the coat and you put a little piece of paper in front of an area and you take a knife and you put it behind the coat and you just stab right through and the blade comes through the jacket and then there's this ripping sound as you pull. It, it's very realistic. <laughs> I had, I tell you, I did have this one moment. Magic has taken me around the world. I've had the craziest experiences because you quite often are in a place where there's other stuff that's going on around you. I found myself once in a foreign country in the middle of a military lockdown while the person I was performing for, who was a, a world leader, was planning a coup. I can't, it, it just, you can't like write some of the, the shit that, 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 that I've experienced because you're entertainment, you're invisible and uh, people kind of forget you're there and then you hear and you see. I used to deal poker for what uh, was very similar to the Beverly Hills Poker Club and they would hire magicians to deal because we knew how to fake uh, if you want to deal a deck of cards, you want to fake a game, then you, you might want to deal the second card, which is uh, which is kind of like taking the second card because you want to keep that for for yourself or for your partner. Um, and so magicians, we know like dealing from the bottom of the deck, so you know so you know what to look for. So they would hire magicians to make sure nobody was cheating. Okay. 
And uh, I got the last one I did, I, I wasn't very good at poker. So I didn't, wasn't, I wasn't really a good dealer in that respect. But um, they had everyone came to this house on Coldwater Canyon, and they bought $100,000 in cash. So it was these executives and these very high rollers and all the money. I remember the security, all the money putting being on a table in the middle of the room, a couple of million dollars. And then all these tables that were set up and there was caviar and probably cocaine. I don't remember. And all this other stuff. And then they just played until the wee hours of the morning until there was two people and then they played and whoever won took the cash home. Wow. Like the magic, it's not just doing a kid's birthday party. It is. I've been on a yacht doing magic for people following the the yachts in the, in the America's race, um, uh, throwing up, uh, running up, throwing up over the edge and going back down and doing more magic. And, um, it, it's, it's been, it's been a beautiful experience and sometimes terrifying, mm -hmm. like this world country thing, uh, world leader thing, but, um, it, oh, yeah, yeah. I've met some really amazing people on the way. So it, it's been good to me. Is yeah. the magic community different for you than the acting community, or are they two very different worlds, or do they ever overlap for you? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people in the acting and film and television production community who are amateur magicians. Mm -hmm. You know, they go back to you can go back to uh, someone like say uh, Johnny Carson who loved magic and would mm -hmm. often be up at the Magic Castle. J.J. Abrams who loves magic and understands the power of mystery and secrets and holding stuff back. Uh, Larry Fong, who's one of the greatest cinematographers of all time, is also a damn good magician. Nathan East, who plays an incredible bass player, who's an incredible magician. Dave Edmonds, like mm -hmm. you, you find as it, these they, these disciplines over overlap absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's uh, so re repeat the question to me because I think I went off on a. Oh no, I was just asking if the communities were separate for you or do they overlap? And they seem like they're both welcoming. Correct. Yes, except I feel like if I go to another city and uh, I'll, I'll call up a, an actor and go, hey, I'm an actor, I'm in town, I'm taking a job away from you, let's go, you know, I don't think that's going to go down as well. If I'm doing a magic show, it's just, a, you know, I know that when I go to France, there's a bunch of guys who are going to show me Paris, take me places. We're going to sit and jam till two in the morning because we jam magicians just like musicians will sit and jam magicians will sit and jam and try and top each other and do stuff so i i feel in many ways there is more of a sense of community in the magic world maybe than there is in the acting world i feel the acting world is still very competitive right there's a lot of people who are who are not so when I, when i got my first series i remember which was nikki uh for wb i remember you find out who your friends are. You find out who's jealous, the competition, who's rooting for you, mm -hmm. you know, the passive aggressive kind of, don't be, don't be a big shot. Don't get big headed on us. You know, that's just a way of it's passive aggressive. And so you, you, you learn that. I don't, don't think I ever experienced that in the, in the magic world. Is, and there was a time when I was working in Las Vegas and doing quite well. Uh, is there a magic trick that especially inspired or moved you? Because some of them can be very moving, you know, they're not just, you know, they're, yeah. they're really... Penn and Teller, uh, I'm a huge fan of Penn That's and Teller. That's what I was thinking of. There's yeah. a flower, there's a flower. The flower and the shadow and the silhouette is just one of the most... But but Teller has a piece with a ball that, that animates and floats and has a character and comes to life. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Yeah. Is there a trick that you would love to master that you are still working on or you haven't mastered yet? I, I haven't mastered anything. I, I feel like I, I'm always in, trying to improve it. Um, it was a very interesting experience touring with the illusionists because I was planning on doing some bigger stage stuff. And then we had a conversation and they were like, well, you can do close up on camera with a 50 foot screen behind us. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing uh, the, the last 10 minutes of my close up show, which I'd done at the Magic Castle for some 20 years. Um, to a camera with two people up on stage and hearing the response from 5,000 people in the audience wow. to a card, a card trick on stage on a screen was one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life. And, and I had to change things because when you're on a screen, you don't get the power of misdirection. Um, it's next to impossible. Uh, so you have to change your methods a little bit. When you're live, there's so much going on with people and talking conversation and people will yell stuff out and you, you have fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, 
on on a camera screen it's 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 much more challenging um so i'm always learning so there is no there is no particular piece that is in my mind perfect but uh uh i was very proud of this one routine um where this card just keeps ending up in more and more impossible ridiculous places the card that they've signed and uh, that was that was really fun and then my mentor dick turpin did this trick where uh, he would make and it was a challenge because using pure sleight of hand you make 10 cards go from your from your hand and into your trouser pocket and one at a time they will go from the hand and you cannot see how they get there and it is the biggest challenge in the in the world it's the, for the last couple of hundred years magicians have have tried to it is known as one of the hardest tricks in the world to do um and so when i got video from the new zealand trip and i i, I suddenly had video of my old mentor dick turbin doing this trick and he'd always wanted me to do it it was too hard for me when i was a kid and i learned it i learned that trick and, oh, wow. then, and then I started creating my own methods. And before you knew it, I created this whole thing called C2P, which was 120 different videos and seven hours of content on this DVD collection, all based around this one trick, whether it was moves or versions of sleight of hand ways of doing it, non sleight of hand ways of doing it. And kind of, it was, uh, it was kind of, that's kind of what opened the floodgates of creativity. So my one man show, I closed with that. I have film of him doing it and then me doing wow, it and then wow. the last moment together yeah that's it's a great uh, legacy for it him. is yeah so from him to you so yeah so it was great especially yeah. since he inspired you so much so yeah and, and you don't realize it often until you don't realize who you inspire mm -hmm. until later on somebody says to you uh oh hey you know this was important to me when i was a kid and you said this to me or mm -hmm. you just gave me a kick you know you just gave me a kick when i needed it so I think we all um, inspire people around us and quite often we're not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. you know, the Monster High was a perfect example of-, of Right, wow, and really? it's happening to you and people are telling you that they're yeah. coming full yeah. circle, you know. Yeah. Um, now, Jeanette uh, had a question for you and we don't want to put you on the spot, but I love this idea. Um, if willing, would you perhaps do a small magic trick for us? A small magic trick. Oh, I wish I wish I could say I came prepared. I just um, <laughs> I don't have a, I don't know if you can see this. It's the problem with doing everything on camera. Let me just fan the box and we'll make the box disappear. There we go. All right. So uh, now the idea is we're going to do a little bit of magic uh, here, but it's tough to do magic when the cards are. Let me see if I can come in closer so you guys can see. Uh -huh. can, you, can you guys see the deck of cards right there? Okay, yeah. What's the best? What's the best hand in poker? Oh, so now, uh, your royal flush and we'll get rid of the rest of the deck there we go so now all we've got left is the one two three four five cards the rest of the cards have gone <laughs> no that's not. i'll show you i'll show you how to do something because uh, uh i'll teach you a little trick this is the one of the first things i i mean <clears throat> i'm preparing something underneath the camera that you're not supposed to see i'm not even supposed to tell you that's what i'm doing uh, but i'm going to do it here okay right now hopefully uh this is a red handkerchief. You can tell it's red by the color. Um, if you're colorblind, it's a black handkerchief. If you have synesthesia, it's ah! Okay, so what we'll do is we'll push the red hanky in and as it goes in, it seems to change color. If you're watching this in black and white or monochrome, this probably isn't gonna mean much to you, but you can see how the handkerchief just seems to change colors. I'm gonna show you how this trick works. Okay, so don't worry. Uh, I will show you this and that's basically it and there's nothing else. So hold the applause, oh you did. Okay, so here's how this works. Basically I have another handkerchief inside the palm of the hand right here. I have a little trap door inside the palm of the hand. So what happens is, is before, underneath the camera, I shove the, the, the red handkerchief right here. The yellow handkerchief is it. I shove the odd colored handkerchief into the, into the hand like that, right? So, and then I've got the, the other here. Now, it's important as I start, I don't open that hand that gives everything away. You don't want to do that. You want to keep it shut, keep that handkerchief you know, right in there. Uh, then you come out and you show that you've got the, um, you've got the yellow hanky. And now as you push it in, you just open the trap door and you, you pull out the handkerchief. And that's basically how that thing works. There you go. So it just, it goes in like that. Don't obviously do this because that gives away that you've got the two <laughs> handkerchiefs. You need to keep this, you need to keep this tight right here. So that that goes into the hand right, as you're doing it and you pull it out like that and then it goes all the way in like this and then when you're done uh you just go like this and take your applause and that's basically how it works so don't tell anyone big secret so no sorry i wasn't prepared otherwise i would love to have done something for you can you uh, thank you for doing that by the way and we are applauding many of us are muted but we're applauding like crazy you're welcome and then um, yeah. 
tell me about a little more about Magic on the Go and what inspired you and what you're doing with it. When I when I started doing the the card to pocket thing, I realized there's so much out there um, that I love about Magic that you just can't get from a book or you know a trick that you buy at a Magic shop. And so I wanted to create this online database of Magic for people who want to learn Magic, different levels, different skill levels but also to celebrate the history of it and the, what I love about it, the beauty of it. And so there's magic. So I created so this online kind of, it's like a Netflix for magic. Anyone who wants to learn magic is an immersive site. You kind of deep dive into it. Um, and, but there's also elements of the history. And like I'll, I found recently found this magician called Charles Waller from the early 1900s. It's an Australian, excuse me, Australian magician who created some of the most incredible magic no one knows of. Mm -hmm. And and so I've done. I'm going to be doing a series about him. Another guy from New Zealand called Cecil Keach, and, and just kind of discovering magic of the past before it gets lost. Mm -hmm. The history of it, the beauty of it. Magic has gone through like if you just look at the last 150 years, you know, and and the history of the world, you can see how magic has changed depending on what's going on, what the wars are. And so I wanted, I just wanted to create something that celebrates it, that teaches it, but teaches more than just the secret, you know, that teaches the performance of it, how you can make it your own. How to, so quite often there are pieces from my own show that I will film performances of, and then I'll actually teach a piece from my act just because I want someone to understand what it is to, to not just do the trick. Magic nowadays, there is a tendency to just, to just, uh, you know, go like, oh, done, that's it. And then they walk on, right? Which is, there's a place for that, I guess. Yeah. But I love presenting it and, and selling it and having a good time with it. So I teach that as well as the actual magic. So my goal is to have a thousand videos. We're 800 already. Wow. Crazy to think about. And um, yeah, and so I'll have a thousand videos and it will become this kind of online searchable database. So you can learn magic wherever you are uh on your phone on your pad or computer and uh it's all searchable and so that's why it's called magic on the go and, I, and to be honest i had a show this friend of mine asked me to do his son's wedding and i haven't done a private magic show um since 2015 when i did this crazy thing with uh this i found myself in the middle of this political thing but um which i hate to be cryptic about but i signed an nda so i can't tell the details uh because they'll probably kill me but uh i'll write about it one day but um the uh but yeah so, my, so that's fine <laughs> yeah yeah it was nuts but um so my friend asked me if i would do magic at his son's wedding and, and i was like no i haven't no and i'm like he goes name your price and i'm like okay <laughs> as, as we come out of uh you know COVID, this this lockdown so um it was really interesting to to uh, having had two years of no performance to kind of put a show together that was just purely a magic show and not narrative show mm -hmm. uh and it was a lot of fun and i went but i i actually used magic on the go to relearn my own routines oh wow so i was like oh yeah there was that oh that's a good gag are you oh right i used to say that i used to do that um and put it all together so it's it's even useful for me and i put it up online well, I love that it's the perfect gift, by the way, if anyone <laughs> looking yeah. magic on the go.com. Well, and you're preserving history as well, which I love, you know, you're, you're yeah. the legacies of these magicians who are gone. So, yeah. Um, and there's some great stories. And, uh, and by the way, we need more women in magic. So anyone who's interested go on the site because I, you know, there's a huge surge, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. women are more and more involved in magic and becoming magicians and, and, and uh, I think it's fantastic, and, um, uh, and we need to make that balance. So, so uh, there's no reason. I think a lot of I think a lot of ladies think that their hands are too small, mm -hmm. and they, they can't, but it's not the case. Uh, some of the great magicians in the early 1900s had really small hands, but were able to adapt, use different techniques uh, in order to you know entertain. Um, so uh, yeah, I invite, I challenge. Uh, any women out there who want to learn magic to get oh. into it, not just with my site, go to the library, get a book, um, yeah. everything's available, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you've said magic on the go, they can actually search by trick so they can go in and if they want to Yeah, so you can say, you can search by cards, you can say, you say like matchstick, put it in, it'll pull up a couple of things with matchsticks, or mm -hmm. if you want to learn about palming, whatever that might be, you can put that in and it'll come, you know, come up, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you can just start watching videos and deep dive and one thing will lead you to something else and you'll learn, you know, 
sometimes it's the best way to go like life right you pick stuff up along the way yeah. and kind of that you didn't expect i'm torn because as a viewer i like not knowing um i'd love yeah. to know more but i i kind of like not seeing behind the curtain you know i like just believing everything you do and going i, I don't it, it's too beautiful i don't want to know so but th this is the problem uh there are two kinds of audiences now there's the audience that really goes with it and and loves it or there's the audience who just googles everything you're doing and finds out and, and says this is how he does it <laughs> you know and <laughs> oh, this no. is part of the danger now but i have a friend of mine cb who just uh she's been studying on magic on the go for a couple of years she just passed her audition for the magic castle you know and oh, i couldn't be great. so i couldn't be proud of that's just a great moment and, and uh she put a you know put her own act together but she she used a lot of the material and a lot of kind of the the structural stuff that i teach as well mm -hmm. that was yeah well, I'm going to make sure everybody has it's magiconthego.com. And then I also have it as magiconthego.vhx.tv. Yeah, I mean, you can go or you can just go. Yeah, magiconthego.com will take you there. Nope. Uh, just go to stevevalentine.com slash magic. There's a lot of information about it there as well. Okay. Yeah, it's all on the same site. There's, then, a, there's a testament there to how I'm okay with magic and acting and that I have magic and acting on my website together. That was a big deal. doesn't feel like it, but it was it's so amazing. great, though. It's a culmination. Yeah. I love yeah, that. It, yeah. Any other questions from anyone before we, we, we wrap out? Happy to answer anything. I had one uh, one final question for you. Um, uh, yeah. well, perhaps final. Um, is there anything that you wish people knew about you as a performer or as a person that maybe isn't as well known? I'm actually three foot five. <laughs> well, I just work with very small. No. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm pretty open about most things, but okay. uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, I'll ask those things you never know until somebody asks you the right question. It's interesting. Selinka just said that she's going to arrive at the family dinner with a new and unexpected trick. That's the way to do it. That's yeah. The way. yeah, hell yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, no, I, I feel like um, I think life is a journey and some I'm always learning and you know, you make mistakes along the way and uh, just trying to be aware of everything. I think more, more now than ever and having kids taught me a lot about that. So kind of being present and in the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got, uh, I want to throw out some warm wishes for you. We had a long yeah. list of people who just wanted to send love and thanks uh, for Alistair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Rossini from Nadine Felanderis and the Facebook Caboodlers. A lot of these people who I've met and <laughs> want to say hi to, yeah, in the various uh, conventions. Calista, sure. Yeah, Callista Plays, Bam Games, Owen, Haley Hughes, The Dragon Age Universe, Laura Klotz, Artsy Warden, and Phoebes. And we all just want to wish you a wonderful holiday season. And they all wanted to say thank you. So My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for being interested in this. And thank you for doing this, uh, you know, putting this all together and raising money for such a a great cause much thank appreciated you so much for joining us and happy dragon age day thank, thank you, you for making such a difference for us this year my pleasure happy holidays everybody happy holidays thanks steve bye uh